Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Доброго дня, дамы и господа. Today panelist session we will uh, have in English, so if somebody will need some headphones or translation, please, I believe there is a service to pick up. Uh, I'd like to start our uh, infrastructure panel session with the introduction of our speakers today. Um, Mr. Andrei Pivovarsky, Minister of Infrastructure of Ukraine. Uh, Andrei Pivovarsky finished his Kyiv uh, National University in year 2000 and got his second master degree in business and finance Fletcher School in 2003. His career was very much related to the investment sector and the late one from 2013, uh, Mr. Pivovarsky was a general manager of Continuum Group where he did a lot of infrastructure restructuring. And since December 2015, Mr. Piorski, our Minister of Infrastructure. Uh, the second speaker of our panel session today is Mr. Russell Pittman. Uh, Mr. Pittman is a Director of Economic Research and Director of International Technical Assistance of the Economic Analysis Group, Antitrust Division of U.S. Department of Justice. Mr. Pittman has a very broad experience in infrastructure restructuring in many countries. China, Brazil, Poland, Russia, and has a lot of work done in, in this area in particular, especially advising on economical reforms in the infrastructure sector. Uh, another speaker of today is Mr. Sevki Adjuna, the YBRD Director of Ukraine. In previous career, uh, Sevki Adjuna spent a lot of time as well in the YBRD headquarter, and uh, the last assignment was in Turkey. And the last but not least, uh, our guest is Sergei Vovk. He is head of Center of Transport Strategies. And uh, Sergei was a chief of editor of an Invest newspaper and also put a lot of his efforts in the infrastructure restructuring and a lot of work done in this area as well. And uh, in order to start our conversation, I'd like to share with you some uh, views on economy development. And I forgot about myself. My name is Lena Minich, and I'm uh, at the moment advisor to the Minister of Economic Development and Trade. And my responsibility as advisor is to build the new department of digital economy. Uh, and I'd like to start uh, the conversation from the general view and general approach how the economy can be developed. There are plenty of uh, discussions in this topic and one of them is talking about our geopolitical position. Uh, provided that Ukraine is uh, situated between West and East, uh, there are uh, like opinions and uh, even some work done and papers done uh, to talk about importance of the infrastructure and using the geopolitical position of Ukraine in order to strengthen the economy. So the roads which we used can be rebuilt probably and can be uh, enhanced in order to cover more transport and goods, uh, the railways, uh, the air traffic could be also positioned as a, as a hub between East and West. And uh, our possibility to use the water and water transportation is also quite unique. Uh, this is why I'd like to ask Mr. Pivovarsky, how do you see the strategy of infrastructure development in Ukraine? And uh, the second question over there, we know that the corruption is the biggest issue in Ukraine. How these strategies will address the corruption fight? Uh, Lena, thank you for the introductions and for the questions. Um, everyone knows that Ukraine is strategically situated uh, in the heart of Europe. And everyone talks about the strategic importance of the road infrastructure and the railway infrastructure for transit purposes. Uh, I believe in that as well. So there is no uh, uh, there is no need to talk about this strategic importance, and our neighbors also understand that. But we need to uh, what we need to talk about is the current state of uh, our infrastructure. If we talk about the road infrastructure, uh, ninety seven percent of our roads are in. Uh, uh, inappropriate technical conditions. That's number one. Uh, if we talk about the, and 
the roads require significant multi uh, multi billion dollar investments to fix the existing structure not i'm not talking about right now uh, the new road infrastructure um, number two, uh, the railway infrastructure is also in horrible shape. Uh, it lacked uh, systemic, uh, adequate investments for years, years and years and years. Historically, uh, the Ukrainian railway system has been uh, a sponsor to uh, major industries and uh, our railway tariffs have been, compared to the other countries, have been on the lower uh, side uh, of the curve and uh, as a result because of the lack of appropriate investments we are having an issue with the existing railway infrastructure where very soon our intercity high-speed train will simply be intercity uh, because we have to slow down the intercity trains because of the uh, technical conditions of the um, uh, railway infrastructure. Same goes for the uh, locomotive and the wagon uh, components. Uh, the, the locomotive component is pretty much depreciated 100%. Uh, on the wagon side, uh, we have about 80 to 85% depreciation. So the, the, the state of our railway infrastructure is uh, quite bad. Uh, if we look at the water side, on the seaport side, uh, we're quite, uh, we have um, uh, quite decent infrastructure and uh, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the major issue is the depth of the waters uh, and uh, bec because of the uh, lack of investments in dredging, uh, the large uh, ships uh, cannot cannot come to our ports except for uh, Port Yuzhny. And uh, we need to pay special attention to dred dredging and uh, we need to increase the depth of our ports. Um, and uh, uh, at this point we're using not more than 40% uh, of the total capacity of our ports. So there is still uh, room for growth. Um, if the, the volumes uh, increase in the, in the port area. Uh, there's a huge problem with the internal waters. Our internal waters are underutilized significantly. Uh, during the Soviet times, um, we carried up to 50 million tons of uh, cargo um, on the internal waters per year. Last year, I believe we carried four or five million tons, not, not more. Uh, and um, uh, what actually happened, uh, most of this cargo uh, went to the railway and the roads. And because of the uh, inappropriate weight control, our roads are being killed uh, by the uh, cargo traffic. Uh, so our goal is to remove as much possible, um, as, as much as we can uh, of cargo to the internal waters and we'll try to open up the internal waters this year to the extent we can. Uh, and there, there are bureaucratic limitations and there are technical limitations also. We need to start dredging on the uh, Dnieper River and the Bug. Um, uh, that is something that has not been done for years and years. Uh, but uh, we'll start with dredging of Dnipro probably in uh, July. Uh, in August. So, in, in terms of uh, the airspace, we have uh, significant limitations. Uh, after the Malaysian uh, aircraft collapse in, in the summertime of last year, uh, Ukraine is now closed uh, for uh, traffic, uh, air traffic, uh, by many air carriers, global air carriers, passenger and uh, cargo carriers. And if you look at the map of uh, the uh, air traffic routes, you will see that there, there is a pretty much blank spot on this map, which is Ukraine. So we, we need to uh, return confidence in our partners, and uh, that is one of the priorities for me. Uh, in terms of air, air traffic space uh, development. Um, a lot of global air carriers are losing money because of that. Because, again, they have to bypass Ukraine and uh, spend more flight time. Uh, 
uh, but at the same time, for security reasons, they, they uh, at this point, are not ready to uh, use Ukrainian airspace, but uh, we're doing our best to convince them that they should, uh, they should come back. So, um, overall, understanding the strategic importance of Ukraine uh, as a geographic location of Ukraine's infrastructure, uh, we, um, uh, we need to restore our existing infrastructure and uh, potentially start thinking about uh, new, uh, new projects. And until we restore the existing infrastructure, until we restore confidence in our partners, trade partners, etc., uh, it will be difficult to attract investments uh, in new infrastructure uh, projects. Um, so the goal is to stabilize the situation, restore the existing infrastructure, attract investments for in existing infrastructure, uh, start planning for new infrastructure projects, especially in the area of uh, concession roads and toll roads, and, uh, and, and move on. But these are all long-term projects. That These are all not one day, one month. These are super long-term projects. Uh, thank you, Andrey. Uh, the question is, how do you plan to re rebuild the infrastructure? Are you planning to do it on, like, on the government side, or you'd like to privatize? And where? And what is mm -hmm. the approach for privatization in which sectors? Uh, in the uh, port sector, uh, we want to privatize the entire stev stevedoring activity. Uh, Ukraine is one of few countries on the planet that still has state-owned stevedoring companies. Uh, in other countries of the world, the stevedoring activity is private. It's subject to competition. But the state owns the port infrastructure, the wall and the channels that, uh, the water channels that go to the wall. And the state is responsible for the depth of the water and the quality of the walls. Um, so uh, we, uh, I, I hope that over the next week or so, the parliament uh, uh, votes in favor of removing the state stevedoring companies from the list of strategic assets and will be able to privatize them. And uh, there is significant interest, actually, from the international uh, players as well as domestic players uh, for those assets. Um, and uh, when we did our analysis of the uh, uh, for instance, the social package uh, that the state stevedoring companies offer to their employees and the private stevedoring companies that offer to their employees, uh, be there, there was a lot of pressure that don't privatize, uh, there will be a lot of layoffs, that's complete crap. Uh, the private stevedoring companies pay larger salaries have a better compensation package overall in terms of social security, etc. And uh, as soon as the private stevedore comes to the port to, or to the terminal, uh, at first, yes, there is a reduction in the workforce, but then there is uh, a, an increase in the better quality workforce. So uh, we want to privatize this activity and be done with that. In terms of the road infrastructure, uh, the, uh, the way to go is to uh, decentralize the roads infrastructure. The local roads go to the local communities and the state roads stay, to, stay with the uh, newly created or restored um, government agency that will be financing the, uh, the state highways. Uh, we've, uh, the government has started the de budget decentralization process and uh, uh, we already know that the local budgets um, have significant surplus as a result of the first quarter uh, results, and uh, this money should be going for the restoration of the local roads. In terms of the uh, uh, highways, the state-owned highways, the way to go is the concession projects and the toll roads. Uh, we already started the first concession project on Monday, actually. Mm -hmm. It's a, a, a road between Lviv and Krakowiec, uh, about 100 kilometers long. And uh, we started the pre-marketing phase that uh, will last for about one month, one month and a half. Uh, and uh, also, we, we need to finally establish uh, the road fund. We need to channel the money that go f from the uh, importers of oil products to a special fund, and the special fund money 
has to go to the reconstruction of the road infrastructure. Right now, this money goes to paying salaries and pensions, etc., etc., etc. And number three, that's one of the top three priorities uh, for the road uh, development is the uh, severe uh, weight control. Mm -hmm. Unless we handle the weight control on the roads, we'll have an issue. Okay. We need to remove as much weight mm -hmm. as possible from the roads, or if there is an overload, uh, the driver or the company that owns the truck has to pay for that, and this money has to go to the reconstruction, the reconstruction of the road. Of the road yeah. But do we have a weight control at the moment? We do, I believe. But uh, We do. The weight a... looks uh, as follows. Uh, the truck goes over, an overweight truck goes on the road. It gets stopped by the GAI or the trans inspection. Uh, the driver pays 200 and off it goes. Okay. This is exactly the case of yeah. the public corruption, I would say. Yeah. Yes, and uh, we uh, were thinking of doing a test, a, a pilot project in one of the oblasts uh, in Ukraine where the uh, local uh, deputies and the local uh, governor have estimated that on average the driver of the overload truck spends about 15,000 hryvnias per year on uh, the uh, on the bribes on oh, the roads right. mm -hmm. so that's uh, we estimated uh, that to be at all of a total of about 450 million hryvnias per year oh. so we could probably use this money on fixing the roads so the current system of weight control doesn't work period what we are thinking of doing we're thinking of an automatic weight control system mm -hmm. the the system that works in belarus in Poland and other other European countries. Other European yes. countries. Yeah. So we want to take the human hands off this process completely. We will support you in that definitely. We'd like to have ICT in every sector of economy. And uh, Andre, thank you very much for the um, information. How you're planning to address uh, airport, water, and the roads? Let's discuss about railways. And we have a real expert on the railways. Mr. Pittman. Thank you very much. Um, first, let me say, um, as, as, uh, as you mentioned, I am uh, actually an employee of the US government. So I have to say the views expressed are not necessarily those of the US government. That's the fine print at the beginning. Uh, the other fine print is that, as you may be able to tell from my accent, I am not Ukrainian. I am an American, and uh, I. Uh, Hope I will not express too much ignorance of the Ukrainian situation. If I do, I will I will uh, give the excuse that most of what I know about Ukrainian railways I learned from Sergei's excellent publication. So I will I will blame him. Um, the, the Ukrainian economy is, is is an economy that is based very much on bulk goods, on grains, on uh, iron ore, on steel, on coal. It's the kind of economy that to develop the way you want the Ukrainian economy to develop is going to have to have a good railway system. I'm going to focus on the freight railways mostly. We'd all, love, we'd all love to have great passenger railways, but the economy going forward is going to depend on a good freight railway system. And the minister has identified a lot of the problems. The ra current railway system is, is in bad shape. Um, it needs a lot. Um, there is, I, 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 don't, I don't know if I'm behind, if my information is old on this. There is right now, and has been for a few years, there has been a plan to restructure the Ukrainian railway system. Uh, and the World Bank and the EBRD for years have been saying, OK, come on, let's get started, let's get doing this. And, and the Ukrainian government keeps saying, yes, we're getting started, we're doing the best we can. Um, Interestingly enough, the plan that the Ukrainian government adopted, and it wasn't the current government, it's been, it's, was adopted by a previous government, they basically got a lot of advice from the World Bank and the OECD and international experts about how a railway should be restructured. And they said, go to hell, we're going to do what the Russians do. <laughs> and what the Russians do, also what the Kazakhs do, by the way, is they say, uh, don't talk to us about competition. Competition's wasteful. We're military type guys. We know how to command and control. We know how to run a good railway. What we are going to do, though, is open up the rolling stock for private investment. 
the Russians have done this. It's been very successful. More than half of the rolling, the, the Russian rolling stock was in just as bad a shape as the Ukrainian rolling stock is now. And the Russians have opened up rolling stock to private investment. And more than half of the rolling stock on the Russian freight railways is now privately owned. And the shippers are very happy about this. They have, they have a lot, they have modern equipment. Not much of it is their own or their, it's leased. And they're able to use it and it works well. Um, in addition, and again following the Russian plan, the Ukrainian plan, as I understand it right now, is to eventually allow some private passenger trains on the infrastructure. So there would be private passenger trains competing with the Ukrainian railway passenger trains on the infrastructure. But, again, as in Russia, the plan is to maintain the freight railway monopoly of Ukrainian railways. Sometimes I try to pronounce the name of Ukrainian railways and I fail, so I'm not going to try right now. Um, but it's, I'm going to call it Ukrainian railways. The problem that, the problem with this reform plan is that it has been, that in Russia it's been very successful in bringing private money into rolling stock. I expect it may do the same in Ukraine. But as the minister said so eloquently, the infrastructure in Ukraine is in terrible shape. The locomotives are all depreciated. This plan does nothing for that. This plan in Russia, in Ukraine, in Kazakhstan, keeps the railway monopoly coming to the government every year, coming to the Minister of Finance saying, would you please give us some more money because we have these bottlenecks here and here and here. We can't get the freight between Klaipeda and Odessa. We can't get the freight from here to here. The track is in terrible shape. The locomotives are breaking down. Please, Minister of Finance, give us some more money. The reform plans that other, some other countries have used have been designed to get private money into the system. They've also been designed to create competition in the system so that a steel shipper or an iron ore shipper can choose among different railway companies under different systems, there are different models of restructuring that do this, so that they can have competition. And this combination we've seen in many countries, that, again, there are different models, there are different ways of doing it. Western Europe does it differently from Latin America. But there are different ways to both create competition in the system and bring private money into the system. And I just want to focus briefly on what has been a very successful model, if you don't mind the economist term, of restructuring in the Americas. Basically, Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina have all chosen a non-European strategy of restructuring their railways. And what they have done is do what we also, in fact, do in the United, did years and years ago in the United States and Canada, is create competition among multiple vertically integrated railways. And so a little bit complicated, but basically in Mexico, which by the way has almost exactly, Mexico and Brazil have almost exactly the same amount of track as Ukraine, something like 22, 23,000 kilometers of track. They divided the system into three in Mexico vertically integrated railway companies, and they had them serve as many common points as possible. And if we had lots of time, I would put a map up here. And I can draw you a map that shows Odessa getting served by two points, by, by two railways, excuse me. The Kurvbos being served by two railways. Uh, Kiev being served by two railways. And they compete to bring traffic in and out. In Mexico, it's mostly Mexico City, but it also goes to the, to the, um, to the uh, export points. And they compete, A, they compete with each other. So the shippers at these common points have choices. But B, and this is what I, what I emphasize here, they've been extraordinarily successful at attracting private money into the system. They, the, these, these systems in Mexico and Brazil, for example, they have created, they have basically redrawn the map and said, OK, we're going to divide the system, again, almost exactly the same size as the Ukrainian system, into three vertically integrated companies. Each railway company will run its own trains on its own track. We will open up the bids for these three franchises for long-term agreements. They're not totally privatized, but it's 30 years, 35 years, something like that franchise. 
Now, here's a number I want you to remember. In Mexico and Brazil, the private consortia that bid for the rights to control these railways, just bidding for the rights, bid $100,000 per track kilometer, just for the rights. As I multiply that by, say, 20,000, 23,000 track kilometers in Ukraine, that's about $2 billion. That would come from consortia that might include Deutsche Bahn and PKP in Poland. In a wonderful future day when we have world peace, it might include RJ Day in Russia. It might include, um, it might include Warren Buffett's uh, railway, Burlington Northern in the US. These, these, these three victorious con consortia bid a total of about $2 billion for the same amount of track, and then they started investing private money into the system. Billions and billions of private dollars into the locomotives and the rolling stock. Well, I'm sure I've gone over my time. I just want to suggest this as one possible solution. There are others, but I believe that the previous Ukrainian government, I say this very modestly as a non-Ukrainian, made an error when they decided to copy the Russians and accept and adopt this model of railways restructuring, which allowed private money only into the rolling stock and maintained the freight monopoly of the incumbent. I believe you can do better. I believe you can get private money into the system and create competition, and the Ukrainian economy will thank you for years as a result. That's my inspiring speech. Thank you so much. So basically, according to your model, if we will do the bidding for the rights, uh, we can really get a lot of money into the into the state budget. That's that's the world experience. <laughs> world experience. Okay, Andre, would you like to have a remark on that? Yes. Uh, what we're doing right now, we're in the process of finishing the corporatization of Ukrzaleznyt. Yes. So by the 15th of May, we'll have the assets valued by Deloitte. And by the 15th of uh, June, we'll have the state property fund uh, confirm uh, the, the valuation. And we'll start forming the balance sheet of the new company, the Jornstone company, Ukrzaleznitsa. Uh, we are pretty much done with the new bylaws, with the new organizational structure and the corporate management structure. Uh, we are moving away from the structure of the one-man show. We're going to the system of the board, where 50% will be independent board members. And uh, if you don't mind, I will talk to you about that at some point. Mm -hmm. And uh, the CEO of the new company will be a member of the uh, of the board. And uh, we are moving to we're moving away from a system of a bunch of deputies to the functional directors that will be responsible for the different areas of expertise. The, uh, we, we hope to complete the corporatization and the uh, management, well, the corporate management change by September, uh, actually. And after that, we'll uh, move to the, second, uh, to the second stage, which is the, uh, uh, we'll decide on how to make the rolling stock more competitive how to make the use of the tracks more competitive, but we also need to think of the 310,000 employees of Ukrzaleznica. If we go to the full competition right away, uh, a significant amount of the employees of Ukrzaleznica will lose their jobs. And we're talking about 300,000 people. We cannot, as the government, we cannot just make a rapid move without offering a compensation package or an alternative to those employees. So on the one hand, I agree that competition is good, that the uh, competition may bring money and uh, create value. On the other hand, there is a significant social component that we need to think of. That's uh, number one. Number two, the Ukraine, I fully agree with you that the Ukrainian economy depends on the, uh, depends on the quality of the railway uh, services b because of the economy structure. And uh, if we make rapid moves in competition, um, we may not be able to adapt the competitive component to the 
economy to the structure of the economy. So again, we although I agree with you, competition is good. Uh, it will not be a rapid move. It will take couple of years. In case of Poland, it took, I think, five or seven years to restructure Ukrzaliznica. So although we are on the, uh, on the track to reform, uh, we're thinking of, we're analyzing different models, how they work in different countries and on, on different continents. We need to attract capital to rebuild the locomotives, the wagons, the tracks, but we need to be careful. It doesn't mean that we need to be slow, we just need to be careful. Yeah, I believe everything has to be planned very carefully and, and staged. Because these 300 people, if you will offer some other jobs, you, you need to have an education program behind that as well. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, I think we are ready to move to Sergei comments, if you are... Yeah. I've, oh, okay. That's my first time uh, speech in symposium. I have lots of conferences, interviews, but symposium is the first time. So I have done a uh, short homework uh, exactly about the things uh, Andrei Piwarski and Mr. Pittman talk. Just next slide. Ah, okay. So let's talk about the money. <laughs> <laughs> you see, uh, you see the gap. You see extreme gap uh, between needs and facts. So uh, the most dramatic situation is uh, really in the railway, uh, which is extremely important for Ukrainian economy and needs more than 13 uh, billion dollars till uh, 2020. But the same situation on the road and uh, in other transport. So to change the situation, we have to spend every year at least 4 or 5 percent of our GDP. What we have now, it's less than 1 percent. And the uh, current capital expenditure are, are 19 times lower. So it's, it's a dramatic situation. Uh, and what do we have? Uh, we have, uh, uh, as for my point of view, we can uh, uh, talk about infrastructure uh, trap. I mean that uh, develop, to develop Ukrainian economy, we have to change the transport. And for changing the, uh, the transport, we have a lot of money, which can give only GDP growth. So it's a kind of a closed circle, and Mr. Pivarsky team have to find the way out. Where is the way out? Uh, next slide. The bad news also is that, no, uh, that neither state and no private investors uh, have no uh, money to go from this infrastructure to, to tap with its uh, own resources. So the only one way is private partnership projects, but in Ukraine it's still tabula um, uh, We have uh, actually three main forms of development the situation. I'm talking about rent, privatization, and concession. Uh, actually shows four of them, but uh, public ownership, it's, uh, in fact, the, con the conservation of the current situation, and I think it's not uh, the way we need. Uh, all of these variants uh, has its own advantages and uh, disadvantages. Um, what to choose? As for me, uh, there is no one unique decision. Uh, every segment, even every company, may have its unique format. Uh, and, uh, for example, in port we can uh, use uh, as privatization and also rent, which is using now, and we can use uh, a concession when we think about development uh, of the port assets in the nearest futures. But uh, to change the situation, we have to destroy these bottleneck things. Uh, uh, what we have to find? First one, and it's extremely important, it's strategy. It's look like a basic uh, principle, but uh, all the transport strategies now are uh, no more useful uh, because uh, they, have, uh, they have not included the factor of Donbass and Crimea. Uh, the cargo flows uh, changed dramatically after the, uh, after the annexion of Crimea and war in Donbass. So we have to think now what port, what railways, and what roads are really need for Ukrainian economy now? What goods will be transformed? The other, the other point is outdated legislation. Uh, 
So just see the year of passes of main laws. It's 1955, it's 1996, uh, 90, uh, 2001. It's not good, and I hope this year we will have a new uh, law about uh, internal waterways. As I know, it's now a great point of discussion in the uh, Ministry of Infrastructure. The same situation with the railway uh, law. Uh, uh, we just have a, con uh, a conception, I think. We, we have no the project. We'll have the project until it's done. Ah, okay. Uh, and uh, we have to... To, uh, to change it in the nearest years, because uh, the, 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 the law we have now, it's, it's extremely old. And the third point, and last but not least, actually, it's financial uh, instruments. Uh, in every conferences uh, for investors, I just see the same faces. It's the faces of EBRD, it's the faces of World Bank, it's the faces of uh, international uh, uh, funds. But uh, it should be one of the topics also for Ukrainian bankers. Maybe for the Ukrainian state bankers, maybe for Exim Bank, which have, which, uh, which have to find the money to invest in the bottlenecks, maybe. Uh, so I think uh, only after the three uh, points will be destroyed, we will use and choose uh, one of these variants uh, and we'll find our logout. Thank you. Thank you, Sergey. And uh, I believe, Andre, you had a strategic session recently. This is what we learned from the Facebook. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Maybe you can share which way you, you'd like to go. And uh, also, f from my little experience, I know that you are dealing already with the legislation. There are a yeah. lot of preparation work done in terms of deregulation, change of norms, increase in competition. So please share with us. Yeah. If, uh, if you go back to the presentation, uh, you saw that the law, the existing law on the internal waters was adopted in a different country. If you look at the tariff, at the tariff structure of Ukrzalizneitsa, you will see that it was adopted in 1967. And there are lots of things that uh, still date back to the Soviet times. So, uh, in terms of the internal waters, we're finishing the draft law, and next week we should be ready with the final draft. And uh, we are opening up the internal waters. We are opening up the internal waters not only for the local players, but for, this, uh, for the international players as well. We'll uh, uh, allow foreign flags, foreign, foreign sh ships with foreign flags. Uh, uninterruptedly use the uh, uh, internal waters. We need to do some dredging, we need to make certain investments, we have the money to do so, to do that, and uh, 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 hopefully during this session, the parliamentary session will, uh, will have this law adopted at least in the first reading, so that by the end of the year we have the law. Uh, adopted by the parliament and uh, we open up the internal waters not only for traffic but also it will uh, create uh, an uh, attractive investment opportunity for the local and international players to develop the local waters, the internal waters. In terms of uh, the uh, uh, law um, uh, that uh, will govern the railroads, uh, we are, we, we have, uh, we are about two weeks away from a, a solid draft that will uh, actually uh, open up to a public discussion. Uh, it's been drafted by a group of uh, international experts and local experts and the Ukrzaliznica people and the ministry people, but it's not yet ready for the public general public discussion and hopefully in a couple of weeks we'll, we'll be there. Uh, but for Ukrzaliznica, it's also important to uh, work out a new strategy, a new tariff strategy. As I told you, the existing tariff uh, plan was created during the Soviet times when Ukraine was a part of the Soviet Union, and uh, the current tariff structure favors long distance uh, deliveries. Uh, the, the, the economy is different, Ukraine is different now, and uh, uh, we need to. Uh, modernize the tariff structure and uh, I already had several uh, strategic sessions with the uh, freight carriers 
and uh, actually we had three meetings already. Uh, very good discussions with the not only the freight carriers but also with the uh, uh, with the companies that the, with the producers with the producers. I'm not, we're not talking about the passenger traffic at this point. Only the freight. Uh, the shippers, if you look at the revenue structure of Ukrzaleznice, you will see that the passenger traffic has a, non, non, a minor non-existent share. It's uh, the freight traffic that generates uh, the revenues. And if you look at the revenue structure from, from traf freight traffic, you will see that top five uh, customers of Ukrzaleznice are responsible for 50% of all volume. Uh, shipped through Krzaleznice and about 52% of all revenues. If you look at top 10s, top 10, you will see that almost 75% of volume and money is generated by top 10 customers of Krzaleznice. But if you see, if you look at the operating income at EBITDA, uh, you will see that uh, those top five clients uh, are not generating any EBITDA. They create a lot of volume, but no EBITDA whatsoever. And uh, uh, we are having uh, a very delicate discussion, uh, the ministry and Ukrzaleznica and those uh, uh, top five slash top ten uh, um, customers of Ukrzaleznica. So we need to find uh, a reasonable solution so that Ukrzaleznica has enough capital to restore the railroad infrastructure and uh, the customers are not significantly, uh, do not get a significant financial hit because we understand, we all understand the economic realities of Ukraine uh, today. But historically, as I mentioned half, a year, uh, half an hour ago, Ukrzaleznica has been subsidizing a lot of industries and a lot of customers. It's time to change things. Otherwise, we will have Ukrzaleznica uh, uh, dysfunctional. We need to find internal resources to make investments in infrastructure. So we discussed the internal waters, we discussed the ports, it's privatization, we dis but not the port infrastructure. We're talking about the stevedoring activity. A lot of people confuse the port infrastructure with the stevedoring activity. We're not privatizing the geographical locations. The infrastructure, the port infrastructure stays in the government ownership. It's the stevedoring activity that uh, is subject to privatization. Um, the, in terms of the railroad infrastructure, we already uh, spent enough time. In terms of the air traffic, uh, we need to develop the local uh, potential of Burispil, of uh, Lviv, of Odessa, and the local airports. As you already know, we opened up uh, uh, Lviv airport for anyone who wants to, we adopted the principles of the Open Sky Agreement to Lviv, and anyone can, can come to Lviv to develop the uh, Lviv airport infrastructure, infrastructure, and we already have one case, which is Atlas Jet. Um, we uh, understand that Borispil is a hub, and we need to do anything possible to attract more uh, transit traffic to uh, to the airport, and we already see that uh, uh, the uh, um, the results for March for transit uh, about 25-30 percent up from March of last year in terms of transit traffic. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, uh, the road infrastructure, we need to we started the reform of Ukravtador. And we need to keep pushing for the reform. Ukraf the door has to be changed completely. It cannot exist in the f current form. It's a dead animal. Uh, so we need to decentralize the road infrastructure. We mm -hmm. need to decentralize the management, the uh, uh, the, the road maintenance infrastructure. The local obal of the have to go to the local communities. And we need on the remnants of the 
pad duck well, well, well the, the maintenance company we need to create something new that will be responsible for the management mm -hmm. of the highways mm -hmm. of the state highways we need to push for the uh, concession roads we need to push for the toll roads we need to push for the weight control and we need to make changes to the procurement law we need to allow long-term contracts for maintenance of roads we have one-year contracts right now it's not only for roads, for, for many strategic well, especially projects. Especially yeah. for many strategic projects, projects I agree. Yeah. We need to, have to provide an investment horizon to the mm -hmm. local and international construction companies. In Europe, the average contract is seven years. When you have a contract for seven years, you understand the volume of works, your cash flows, you can play in, pl plan your investments. And your you can, return on investments. And your return on investments. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, it's uh, the 26th of uh, April, and uh, in certain oblasts, we haven't started the, uh, uh, the, the local renovations, whatever, Yamkova, Remonte, we haven't st started fixing the, the holes in the roads because we haven't completed the tenders. In some cases, we complete the tender and there is uh, the anti-monopoly committee or someone argues that the tender was done improperly. So for, it's been four months into the year already and we haven't started yet. And the money is allocated for one year only. Mm -hmm. So in certain areas, we will complete the tenders by the end of May or by the end of June. And the season lasts until October. We have only four months, so we need to create an investment horizon for the uh, private and state players so that we don't need to go into the standards every single year and have only three or four or five months of, uh, uh, of working conditions. For the real work, yeah. yeah for the real it's, world. Yeah, it's a clear problem. It's not only related to the infrastructure. It's for every long-term development yeah. government-owned. Uh, it's, it's really an issue. As, as a summary, uh, well, we, we had a strategic session of the ministry. Uh, and uh, as a summary, the number one priority is to launch uh, long-term systematic changes that may not have an impact today or tomorrow, but will have an impact on the certain industry uh, next year, two years down the road. Thank you, Andrei. Uh, great, great approach. And uh, in the Ministry of Economy, I believe we will support you in that, definitely, because we are facing the same issues with long-term projects for the even legalization of the software. We cannot complete it because of that. What is funny, another uh, thing about the software, in Ukrzaliznica we have a lot of software, different licenses, etc. Most of it doesn't belong to Ukrzaliznica. Even yeah. though some of it was created with the Ukrzaliznica money, it does not belong and we have to pay fees, sick, pay huge, royalties. abnormal fees for the usage of licenses and software, etc. Et yeah, as, as we know, we know that as well, it's in many ministries such uh, picture, unfortunately, and we are moving to money. So, Mr. Junior, what will be your advice? <laughs> Where is the money? <laughs> Show us the money. <laughs> well, I knew it was going to come to money. <laughs> I think the the money will come if uh, engagement of private sector is, is secured, either in the form of privatizations or in the form of public-private partnership. And of course, that has to be, especially when I'm referring to public-private partnership, an appropriate uh, infrastructure for the uh, public-private partnership to be realized has to be in place as well. You know, a proper set of laws, proper set of rules, uh, the uh, ability to uh, constructively and flexibly negotiate contracts with, uh, with the public sector partners, a predictable uh, business uh, climate, a economic uh, stability, uh, and uh, reliable, uh, if you like, uh, regulation and, and uh, supervision. What about rule of law? Because well, I think it's I, that's also what I mean uh, by uh, by the the predictable and, predictable. and, and reliable uh, uh, 
game uh, rule of uh, rule of law and, and, and rules of game and, and not to be changed right. in the middle of the the road as as we have seen in in, in uh, different instances of course uh, you know this is necessary because as as we are all hearing there isn't enough money there isn't enough time and there might not be enough uh, also a, a competence and this is not to derogate any any of the authorities but Obviously, logic, uh, economic logic calls to leverage off relative competencies of the public sector and the private sector. And this is what the PPP structures are all about. Uh, the bank is, and, and not only us, but of course uh, other international financial institutions, but equal, equally importantly, uh, commercial banks are prepared to lend into uh, PPP structures, provided you have this predictable environment uh, governed by rule of law and uh, other necessary infrastructure is there. Uh, and, and then it's a question of uh, setting appropriate return incentives for the private sector to be involved. And, and of course, uh, as, as part of uh, the overall thing, I'm not just talking about the economic and industrial infrastructure, but also the other service infrastructure, municipal and environmental infrastructure, has to be part of this as well. And that's where you have to think about creating also the appropriate support structures for the people who will be impacted by the full commercialization cost recovery price structures. So that is the route to go. It okay. requires a grand blueprint master plan of prioritization based on uh, the resource availability. But I, I see and I know that the minister's team is working on that. So hopefully, uh, you know, we will start working uh, towards those kind of partnerships as well. Uh, what about PPP uh, legislation? Can you say us why it doesn't work in Ukraine? So you've been observing it probably already for many years. Well, I, I can tell you one thing. I'm not an expert at all in terms of legislative structure. And I haven't studied you know, what are the shortcomings. But I have been involved in, in PPP negotiations uh, as a financier in the, in the Turkish context. And I can tell you, you cannot foresee everything. So you have to have the basic rules of the game and the rule of law principle, but then you have to have a competent but uncorruptible body of experts to then sit down and negotiate major concessions, major PPP projects according to that particular investments need. You know, you, you have issues such as, you know, what will happen to interest rate hedging costs if you uh, break the uh, uh, concession? What will happen to uh, the, the remainder of the employees that are, uh, you know, uh, engaged by the public sector and the private sector? Infinite number of issues that come up when you get into the integrity of public-private partnership contract. So you cannot create a blueprint law for that will address everything. You just have to set the right structure and then have a body uh, do it uh, as, a, as a competent and uncorrupted uh, authority. Okay, uh, it's clear, but uh, uh, except of IBRD and World Bank, uh, from where we can expect a financial help? I think we will have a donor conference coming, uh, coming week. I think the, the money will come the moment we create this uh, environment of confidence for investment. I mean, banks and, and financiers have to deploy that money. You know, you, it, it's, it's, it doesn't grow by itself. It only grows if you lend it to uh, an, an investment opportunity. So it, to the extent that we can create the right structure, reliable uh, environment, we start with IFIs, of course, and we will encourage the private sector, and eventually commercial banks will come into the play. I think maybe Andre would like to add on that. Yeah, uh, confidence is actually uh, the word uh, right now. Creating awareness of what we're doing is the second, actually, uh, word. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, over the past two to three weeks, uh, every single day, I have missions of brand name international investors and companies that are interested in investment in investing in infrastructure in this country. And uh, it took us, uh, it took the ministry several months to convince the private players that things have changed, that we are different, 
We speak the same language, we understand you, we are not corrupt. We're not favoring anyone, we're not lobbying anyone, but we need investments and predictable investments. And believe it or not, but uh, even ArcelorMittal, that has been very critical of uh, the situation in Ukraine, uh, came to me last week, and the CFO, the CEO of Arcelor, and uh, very cautiously asked if there are any opportunities in investing in port terminals in Ukraine. And uh, it took uh, a couple of months to convince them and to fix the issues that they used to have on the railways and in the ports, etc. Those bureaucratic, artificial issues that have been created to uh, by individuals to, to benefit uh, from Arcelor, those have been removed. And uh, suddenly they came to me and said, "So, again, very cautiously." But if there is anything else, and uh, I had uh, Soufflé uh, traveling all over the port system uh, last week mm -hmm. uh, and this week, and uh, they had a huge team, and uh, they are trying to identify uh, investment opportunities in the port area for themselves. And uh, uh, two more international teams will go next week to, uh, to the Ukrainian ports. So confidence is number one. And speaking the same language is number two. And it's extremely important uh, for the business and for the IFIs to know that there is a, a, a team or a group of people, there are individuals that are not corruptible, mm -hmm. that are not asking for any favors, and they just uh, invite uh, money. And the money will come. Yeah, I fully agree. We, we see the same in the Ministry of Economic and Development. Basically, when the new people started to remove the barriers and do the regulation and also give a confidence in, in the future changes yeah. as well on, on the basis of the working with other companies and sectors provided this uh, confidence in, in, in many areas. Yeah, we are feeling the same. Um, but okay, we, we will do a lot of uh, changes in the infrastructure, but probably there should be some strategic assets which shall not be, how to say, given to public, uh, given to privatization. Uh, what will be these strategic assets? You mentioned already on the infrastructure of ports. Uh, how do you see other strategic assets which has to be regulated by the government? Well, the natural monopolies cannot be privatized. Uh, when we talk about Ukrzaleznica, the tracks should always be in the, in my opinion, should always be in state ownership. Um, uh, we are still discussing internally what should be the destiny of the locomotives, whether they should be subject to competition or not, given the structure of the Ukrainian economy and uh, given the stru uh, structure of Ukrzaleznica. Um, the Ukrainian post, uh, uh, we will corporatize. And uh, uh, if you look at the uh, different experiences across the globe of the post privatization, uh, there are positive cases and extremely negative cases. So, and in our case, the Ukrainian post is not only a state owned business, it also has a significant social component. As you know, the, um, uh, the uh, structure of the population in this country is different from Europe, for instance. There are only 3 to 5% of village people in Europe on average. We have more than 30% of people living in villages. Mm -hmm. And the, very often the, the post office is the only business, so to say, available in that area. So uh, at this point, we're not talking privatization of uh, Ukur Post uh, at all. Uh, and um, uh, in terms of the uh, airports, um, we are not talking about the privatization of uh, the major airports, which is uh, Borispil and Lviv, but uh, uh, long-term contracts with professional international operators could be something that uh, we, we could uh, consider. Uh, at this point. Um, so in terms of the no-nos in uh, infrastructure, it's the uh, 
port infrastructure and the water channels. And it's the uh, the Ukrainian post at this point. It's the tracks uh, of Ukrzaliznica uh, at, at this point. Uh, everything else is discussable. Guys, any any other views on the on the topic? If I may add, it's it's the ownership of the asset is is not the the question. It's the most efficient use, and for the investor, uh, the investment horizon over which it can count on the usufruct of that particular asset that is that is key. So clearly, you know the the natural monopolies such as the ports and everything else could and should uh, perhaps stay in the in the ownership. But the usage and, and the ability to then outsource a variety of services and, and, and other uh, expenditures related to that board for the benefit of probably, uh, private sector investors in a very competitive and transparent way, I think that's one of the fundamental principles as well, that you, know, you have to create true transparency and true uh, competition value for money for the public. That is, the, I think, the most fundamental uh, principle, if you like, of public-private partnership. Are you creating value for the public, for the general public, or not? And that is that is key criteria. And and let me let me expand on that. I guess in in terms of in terms of the railroad track, um, for example, again the the countries that I named in the U.S. Uh, in the U.S. and Canada, the companies actually built the track and own the track. In Mexico and Brazil and Argentina. The state still owns the track, but the private companies were given these long-term franchises. And the reason they were given that is because that was really the only way to, to attract the money into the system. It was very instrumental. That it, was, it was an instrumental idea that we need to get private money into the system. We need to give the companies the incentives to invest in the infrastructure. Um, there are There are there are agreements that there are requirements that in a national emergency of course the army gets precedent of course the government can can have force majeure and use the, use the infrastructure but um, I would make a distinction between actual privatization you know ownership in perpetuity and these long-term franchises 30 years 40 years 50 years I would argue that's not that's that philosophically maybe that's not privatization and instrumentally it's a way to avoid having Urkolzhenitsa uh, have to go to the Ministry of Finance to get new money every year. Yeah, it could be a very interesting model for, for us, Sergey. What do you think? Well, uh, I think that actually it's no big matters. What money will go to the infrastructure, private money or state money? Because finally, all the bills will be paid by uh, final consumers. I'm talking about the passenger and I'm talking about the cargo owners. Uh, so I think it's very important that the uh, payment capacity uh, will enough for our uh, reforming activity. Uh, so very, uh, very important as for me is the uh, uh, strict, uh, strict and uh, good dialogue between the uh, Ministry of Economy and Ministry of Infrastructure, especially in points of tariffs uh, and uh, in the points of development of main uh, cargo, cargo producing and uh, export oriented uh, segments of our economy. I'm, I'm talking about uh, uh, Gamka. Metallurgical complex. I'm talking about uh, APK. It has uh, agriculture. It has its own ministry. But I think it's extremely important to work. Uh, to, uh, in, 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 uh, that infrastructure will be a kind of a plus for this uh, segment and the plus for the uh, comparative uh, Ukrainian production in the global markets. Uh, I'll give you two examples. We have Port Yuzhny. It's uh, one of the most heavy, heavily used ports uh, in the country. And uh, it's uh, primarily populated by actually private terminals. Uh, or, and uh, we, we are seeing uh, right now a bottleneck uh, on the railway side. Uh, the volume is increasing in Port Yuzhny and now the private uh, operators and the state operator uh, competing for the access to tracks. We uh, discussed this and uh, essentially um, we discussed with the private operators of the port that, look guys, we have a bottleneck, but the railroads 
the Ukrzaliznica doesn't have the money to, uh, to build a new track. Mm -hmm. Would you participate in this inf investment project if Ukrzaliznica puts uh, uh, a little bit of money and you put the rest and mm -hmm. uh, you develop this, uh, you un uh, unlock the bottleneck and uh, you transfer the tracks to the ownership of Ukrzaliznica? And they said yes. That's that's number one, and uh, they gladly uh, they would do that because they can unlock value of the terminals that they have. Number two, uh, we already have a, a heated discussion with the Ministry of Economy with Ruslan Kors uh, with regards to the uh, um, somewhat change of the tariff structure mm -hmm. and uh, we need to uh, we need to clearly define what is the track tariff what is the component of the track development in the tariff what is the locomotive component what is the wagon component when we talk about the freight so right now and if we clearly define those components, then we will know that the track component goes immediately into the development or maintenance of the existing track infrastructure or uh, construction of new tracks. Right now, everything goes into one pot and the cash flow is redistributed on the as-needed basis. If we have a hole here, we need to buy gasoline or whatever, we go there. And if we need to buy something else, we go there. So there, there is no systematic approach to planning of cash flows. And uh, if we come to a new tariff structure, we're not talking about an increase in tariffs. No, just we're talking about the yeah. structure, the tariff structure. If we come to the new tariff structure, then maybe we have enough money for maintenance of tracks. Uh, if we remove discrimination of wagons, then maybe we attract private money to the development of the uh, wagon stock in this country. And uh, when I talk, when I say discrimination of wagons, right now we have three types of wagons: uh, the privately owned wagons, the Ukrzaliznica owned wagons, and the so-called inventarne wagons. And the inventarne wagons are the cheapest. They are owned by Ukrzaliznica, but they are called, in, called inventarne. And everyone is uh, fishing for the inventarne wagons because they are uh, the cheapest. And uh, you don't care if it's broken or not. It's Ukrzaliznica's wagon. So, uh, and uh, the price difference is uh, between the privately owned wagons and the inventarne wagons is significant. So, as mm -hmm. a result, the private wagon ownership is not, so to say, welcome. welcome. So if we remove the price discrimination, but there are also transaction costs to attach to those inventarne wagons. So you cannot just get a cheap wagon. Uh, the, pri the, the, the producers still pay a transaction fee on top of what Ukrzaliznica is getting. Mm -hmm. And you know what I mean. So if we remove the wagon discrimination, all wagons will have uh, the same price attached uh, to them. Uh, hopefully, uh, we will, in, in, in this manner, create a market for privately owned uh, wagons. So we'll relaunch the wagon building industry here and we'll, have, uh, we'll improve the quality of the wagon stock uh, in this country. So right now, this is another thing that I'm heatedly discussing with Mr. Korsh, who's the Deputy Very Minister good. of Economy responsible yeah. for the tariffs. State owned infrastructure and, tariffs. And who is actually the head of the working group of uh, reforming, uh, of reforming Ukrzaliznice uh, several years ago. This is why you can have a very good dialogue with him <laughs> about tariffs and stocks. Yes, very good insights on, on, on the situation. Um, and I have last question from my side because uh, my speciality is uh, telecom infrastructure and ICT. Uh, I'd like to know your opinion how by building roads we can improve as well the ICT infrastructure, how by building and renewing railways we can as well uh, increase the infrastructure for not only delivering cargo but also the packets of internet 
What is your view on that? Well, uh, it's a good question. Um, um, unfortunately, I, I cannot give you a very thought through answer to this question because honestly speaking, I, I never thought about that. In, in this manner, and the telecom industry is not under my control uh, any longer. Um, uh, and uh, during meetings with the uh, telecom players, uh, they actually never mentioned this uh, idea at all. And I talked to them about Wi-Fi development in trains and uh, in ports and in yada, yada, yada. So I guess I'm not the best person to answer this question. But it's okay, good start. If you're talking about Wi-Fi development in the railway, it's not possible without building the infrastructure among the railways. So. Well, what is funny is that there is an existing infrastructure along the railways, mm -hmm. uh, and it's privately owned. Okay. Uh, and uh, so there, there is the possibility to uh, provide Wi-Fi services on uh, the majority of tracks. Uh, in some cases, it's uh, not yet possible, but we're figuring out what are the technical possibilities to do that. Uh, but one of the uh, immediate goals is to provide Wi-Fi, at least to the intercity passengers. A lot of uh, people, because of because the uh, the flights in Hrivnia terms uh, have become quite expensive, to a lot of people, they go into the intercity trains, mm -hmm. to the high-speed intercity trains, and a lot of those guys have uh, iPads and iPhones, yes. etc. And uh, they require, they demand Wi-Fi. So uh, we're very close to offering this uh, the service to the passengers. Uh, and uh, in the uh, uh, passenger stations, uh, we will try to provide provide at first free Wi-Fi services in passenger stations as well as the seaports. We'll first start mm -hmm. with the free Wi-Fi, and then we will try to commercialize it. Thank you, Andrei. You wanted to add? No. Uh, basically, for the railways, it's not only passengers. You can improve your efficiency. Uh, by number of times, if you will monitor how your locomotives are driving, so how many current power they consume, uh, how quickly they accelerate, because uh, by monitoring and controlling that, you can save a lot of electricity. It's uh, a lot of stuff down in this area. We can share it with you gladly. We have unique investment opportunities in electrifying the railway system in this country. Only about 47, I think, percent of the track is electrified. The rest is driven by the diesel uh, locomotives. And, and uh, right now, the difference in the cost uh, uh, of carrying one ton of cargo per kilometer on the uh, electric um, train and the uh, diesel train is something like six times. So it's about six times cheaper or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, again, unique opportunities in that, uh, in that area. And uh, the, other, uh, the other thing that we need to change, actually, right now we have six kingdoms, six uh, regional Ukrzaliznices, mm -hmm. yeah. and the driver of the locomotive train cannot really cross the border of wow. one of course wow. yeah so he he has to go to uh, a certain point and then uh, there is a change uh, in the team and uh, they go yeah so uh, there are lots of efficiencies to be found lots and lots so of we don't have a border with russia but we have internal borders yeah uh, we, we kind unfortunately of. we do and uh, uh, those borders come again from the soviet times from the old system but there is no more Soviet Union for 24 years. So yeah, we, we need to accept still. that and make the necessary changes. Exactly. Uh, do we have time for the questions? I think yes. Johannes Andersen from uh, Kiev Post. I don't know whether we can go into the concepts. Uh, we only to about to, to, to hear more about them in, in two weeks if we talk about the, the railways. 
So let me ask you about something else then. Uh, the, I've, I've, I have the feeling that the uh, government is, in Ukraine is quite uh, atomized. Every minister is, is almost working as its own, as you said, kingdom about the railways. Um, I would like to ask you, is the, do you feel that there is an, an understanding in the um, Ukrainian leadership uh, government in, in the broader sense that uh, that that the, the railways uh, we talk about um, attracting money for the for the railways is there an understanding that uh, that these money would also have to come from from public uh, investments for instance in in my country Denmark uh, there's no VAT on passenger uh, tickets could that be an idea that you scrap the pass the, the VAT from the passenger that would be an, an indirect subsidized from the state uh, what we see, uh, on the contrary, uh, in, as I understand it, in the uh, in the current situation, is that the that the railways is actually subsidizing the state by paying uh, tariffs for for diesel. Uh, there's actually road road taxes for diesel uh, and other other uh, uh, payments that is uh, not related to to the railway operation. Thank you. Well, first, well, first of all, there are no ministries slash kingdoms. Uh, there is uh, cooperation, that's number one. Uh, over the past five months, I never experienced that uh, there, 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 was, uh, there were battles between uh, ministries, never in like five months. There is cooperation. There are sometimes heated discussions, but that's normal. That's what we lacked for 24 years, heated discussions. Someone would make a decision and say, this is where we go. Okay, no problem. Let's all go there. No. Um, and uh, the Ukosa Liznitsa has uh, significant cooperation with the Ministry of uh, Energy, uh, with the Ministry of Economy, uh, thanks to Mr. Korsh. Uh, and uh, we, I mean, Ukosa Liznitsa del delivers a lot of coal uh, to the Ukrainian power generation companies. And uh, we need to make sure that there is an, inter an uninterrupted flow uh, of coal. So uh, there are no issues on the cooperation side. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, the, government's f the government fully understands that there are ample opportunities to find efficiency. We're throwing them on the table. We discussed the uh, uh, issue of Ukrzaliznica paying the full price for diesel, although Ukrzaliznica is not really using the roads. <laughs> only in certain parts when there is an intersection. And uh, uh, we discussed this idea. So there, there are lots of ideas that are being d discussed and debated internally. Yeah, from my side, I can confirm that probably the first government which has a truly collaborative manner in all of the questions, just to... But the discussions sometimes get heated, and that's normal. Yeah, it's like in project management. You, you first, how to say, storming and then performing only after. Yes. Yeah. Any more questions? Thank you. Uh, well, with this war going on with Russia and uh, close integration with the EU, I think the logistics uh, are changing towards the European direction. You have touched upon the Lviv Krakowiec improvement. And uh, obviously, there are port infrastructure improvement. Uh, is there anything on finding efficiency in interconnection on the rail railways? Thank you. Yep. Um, yes, we are. Uh, we are discussing. Uh, we have a, a, a twinning a project, a technical assistance project called Twinning, that is uh, financed by uh, a number of European countries. And as part of the project, we are discussing. Uh, ways how to improve the railway logistics between uh, Europe uh, and Ukraine. And uh, we're right now discussing a project called Varyagi uh, and um, uh, a number of uh, other projects. Uh, as part of that discussion, uh, Poland is actually ready to allocate significant resources to fixing the uh, border crossings. Uh, from Poland to uh, Ukraine, and uh, we want to start 
somewhat similar discussions with Romania, Hungary, and other uh, members of uh, that uh, other countries that are members of the European Union. Uh, but uh, again, we need to plan carefully and uh, um, find financing. Our European partners are ready to provide co-financing. We'll appeal to EBRD and IFC and uh, EIB uh, for the sort of funding. And uh, we, we still need a couple of months of uh, discussions until we uh, say that this is the way we go. Go. Those are long-term projects with long-term consequences. So we need to be uh, careful. Еще вопросы, коллеги, можете по-русски задавать, мы переведем, то есть не проблема. Hello, thank you for your question. Uh, my question is, uh, you reminded that, um, and you consider, as far as I understood, uh, that consensual uh, type of infrastructure is one of the best way of um, development of road uh, roads. That it was in Lviv Kozelets uh, road. I think it was like a test. Uh, yes. Um, what about maybe um, implementing some? Um, uh, this approach uh, to, um, to 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 another uh, like times or uh, types of infrastructure where um, government uh, influence uh, is um, is the main. For example, uh, in Ukraine, some maybe it's better to offer um, some part of this infrastructure for private uh, sector. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the. The reason why we are using the concession uh, uh, as a way to attract capital is that that's the only available by law way of creating PPPs at this mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. There's no other way. Uh, so we are trying to do it in the road sector development. We are trying to do it with one of the ports, um, uh, usually. And in terms of uh, railways, uh, until we, until we uh, corporatize the company, we cannot do anything by law. We need to corporatize the company. That's number one. And number two, as I mentioned, uh, it's a natural monopoly. Uh, at this point, there is no discussion of privatizing the tracks. We are open to uh, creating competition in the rolling stock, and there is already competition. Uh, in the rolling stock, uh, except for the locomotives. And we are discussing whether to open the locomotive segment uh, for competition. Uh, there is no clear-cut yes or no answer. In the wagon stock, there, the answer is yes, that's not uh, an issue. But in terms of tracks, concession of tracks, we are not talking about, about it right now. I'll address my question to Minister uh, Pivovarsky. Uh, we have pretty decayed infrastructure, especially roads, and we know in what, in what harsh conditions do you have to work. And But there is a window of opportunity I see you're using by uh, investing, trying to make railroad trans better. And thanks for that, and keep going. But I wanted to ask whether you plan to use the materials, practices that are, for example, used in Israel, uh, like with recycled tires. Uh, just, I'm not a professional in this area, just like to, would like to hear your comment on how it can be used, if it's an, if it's an option for Ukraine, and what do you think about it? Thank you. Uh, yeah, in terms of uh, fixing the roads, there are, uh, historically Ukravtador and the regional representative offices of Ukravtador have been using just one uh, technology. Uh, we have a group uh, right now that is looking into alternative technologies of fixing, of doing minor uh, maintenance works and fixing uh, uh, roads. So we are looking at a number of technologies, including uh, certain uh, Israeli based uh, technologies. And uh, there are quite good technologies from Germany as well. So we want to. Uh, once we decentralize the, man, ma the maintenance component of uh, uh, Ukoravtador, uh, we will 
uh, allow the local communities to decide what kind of a technology they want to use locally. They know better. Again, they just know better. We, we in Kiev cannot know everything, everything. So if they decide that the Israeli technology is the best, go for it. If they decide that the US or Germany based or whatever technology is based, they, they will be able to go for it. But at the same time, uh, we will uh, ask uh, the localized technologies to be used to a greater degree. So in, in right now, the, uh, the current technology is uh, heavily dependent on the oil-based uh, components. The, and uh, the level of lo localization is not more than 50 or 60 percent. We can go to as high as 90 percent. And by localizing the technology, we'll be developing the economy, as Ivor says. Absolutely, yeah, I fully agree. Any more questions? I have the question to Andrei Piovarsky, and the first one would be... I'm sorry, be... guys. <laughs> <laughs> Andre is very popular. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first one would be as from from the representative of the Kiev Bicyclist Association. So, um, do you have a strategy of the bicycle infra uh, infrastructure development, and if it, if it's under your control, and who is responsible for that? And the second question uh, is from the simple consumer concerns railway, and it's about internet access at the uh, train. Uh, as far as I know, there is a. Um, there is such a service already, uh, but um, as I've heard um, from the people who already consume this service, it's um, extremely um, un uncomfortable uh, because you have to go to a special kiosk to buy a special card and the price is uh, um, very high for that. and. Um, so um, maybe it could be a good idea to, so it, you know, uh, it smells a little bit fishy, like it's a like pocket company provide this service. And uh, so um, maybe you should think, or you have planned to hold new tender uh, to provide um, this service. Thank you. Thank you. In terms of the uh, bicycles, road infrastructure, uh, that, that, that's not under my control. You need to talk to the local men, uh, local communities, to the mayor or the mayors, etc. So you should talk to Vitaly Klitschko. And I believe they already have a plan for the bicycle infrastructure development in, in Kiev. Your bicycle, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I, I believe they already have a plan and the bicyclists will be happy. Uh, in terms of the internet, uh, development, you uh, are absolutely right. Uh, your smell, uh, I mean, <laughs> your smell does not fail you. Know? So, uh, what we are talking about right now is high speed Wi Fi service provided by a non pocket provider, right, but by a major provider. I've spoken to several of them already. They see the technical opportunities to provide high speed uninterrupted Wi-Fi service. Definitely on the regular trains. Uh, there is a problem with the intercity high-speed trains. At 150-160 uh, kilometers per hour, uh, we still have interruptions in connection. Uh, but at least uh, there, there, there is one company that is trying to find a technical solution to this uh, to this problem but uh, there will be Wi-Fi shortly and one of the KPIs for the manager general director of the intercity uh, high-speed train company and for the guy responsible for the passenger traffic in Nukorzaliznica is to have Wi-Fi shortly. If they cannot find the technical solution, then there will be other people who will be finding the technical solution. I think, Andre, we can help on that, on technical solution, because there is a technical solution deployed in France and uh, Japan with 300 kilometers per hour. There is no interruption of the service of Wi-Fi in, in, in the trains. Whenever so. someone tells me that there is a problem and that we are unique, 
it no, means that unique. there is a personal interest involved. Exactly. And uh, <laughs> then I put a red flag. And yeah. uh, correct, you, correct. either there is a solution or not. And there is always someone else there who is ready to find a solution. There are plenty of solutions, so we'll definitely next week come with, with the help on that. Any more questions, Jim? Thank you. I also have a question for Mr. Pivovarsky, so I'm sorry. Right. There is a press conference of Andre here. <laughs> well, the question concerns uh, the aviation. Well, on the one hand, uh, you open the Lvov airport for, for all the carriers, but on the other hand, uh, all the rules uh, and all the mechanisms of uh, giving designations to carriers are actually blocked. The new rules are blocked by the Ministry of Justice and the old uh, by the court decision. So uh, how are you going to address this problem and to, to give designations to carriers. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we are in some sort of a, a vacuum right now uh, in terms of giving the designations, uh, but at the same time uh, we have a major international law firm working on uh, doing some sort of a legal due diligence of the current legislation and uh, I hope this law firm will uh, complete the job next week. And uh, based on this legal due diligence, based on this document, the ministry and the civil aviation authority will decide how to move forward. So we'll have some sort of a final judgment on how we can actually provide designations to the uh, air carriers. But at this point, we're only talking about the uh, international traffic. Uh, we uh, There is a way to provide the local traffic designations and the uh, charter uh, de designations. So over the next week or so, we should find a solution. Thank you, Mr. Piovarsky. And my question from these two gentlemen, because you, you had a rest a little bit, so. <laughs> <laughs> and the question is, after this discussion, uh, we mentioned that there should be two main points that investments will come. Trust or confidence that we are on the right way and we are doing the right stuff for doing business. And second, awareness. So what is your perception after this discussion? Are you more confident? Are you more aware? What is the view? <laughs> Well, uh, first of all, I think clearly, as I said earlier, it's, I can see that there's a blueprint that is being worked on. The confidence doesn't come uh, by words. The confidence will come over time through acts and deeds. Uh, I think we as EBRD are, are prepared to take the upfront risk of that confidence because we have the track record and the confidence in, 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 in this uh, government's uh, commitment to the principles that it's enunciating. And I think, I hope through that action that, that we will be able to bring the confidence to the rest of the international financing and investment community as well. In the railway sector in particular, I would I would echo that, and and uh, just it's, it's been my experience and observation that that PKP and Deutsche Bahn and the French Railway, there are a lot of railway companies out there that want to get involved in new countries internationally, that want to invest in rolling stock, that want to invest in locomotives, maybe even in infrastructure that are ready to be operating, I believe, in Ukraine if they get the chance. So I believe if the, if the, uh, if the legal structure were there, now, of course, there's a limit to how far east their trains are going to run. But I think they very much would like to get their trains running. I think PKP would love to have its trains running into, uh, into Ukraine and investing as much into the system as it could. I think Deutsche Bahn would be the same. Thank you. More questions? That's it. That's it. Thank you so much. And thank just you. let's thank you our speakers, Mr. Wolfk, Mr. Pivovarsky, Mr. Ajuner, Mr. Pitman. Thank you so much for your time and sharing it with us.